Good afternoon and uh, welcome back to the CIS webinar. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for the CIS, Centre International des Studies du Sport, International Center of Sports Studies, to organize this uh, second series of webinars. And uh, we are, we are uh, now running in a two weeks time or, or, uh, between each of the, of, the, uh, of the webinars. And if you like to have our program, don't forget, you can always connect to know, uh, to hear our previous webinars or to, to know which one will be the next one. So please do not forget to connect. Uh, I would like to introduce you our panel today. Uh, we will talk about sports mega event, and we have three guests. Uh, we will start with Ashley Hellert. Ashley is a former student of the FIFA Master, and she works at the International Ice Hockey Federation. Hello, Ashley. Nice to see you again. How is Hi. the situation? Uh, how is the situation in, in Zurich? Yeah, everything's good. Um, we are uh, we are plugging along during the COVID crisis. Thanks. So, second uh, second person we have uh, in the in the in the panel is Roma Kana. Roma is a student as well from the FIFA Master Tenth Edition, and uh, we are we have a live from New Delhi. Hi, hi, Roma. How are you? Good. I'm good, Pierre. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Sun in, in Tuscany today, and uh, 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 how is how is the situation in in India? Everything is getting better. Uh Things are uh, with all the festivities that have recently taken place, as we see globally, same thing in Europe, cases are going a little bit higher now. And with winter, it's expected to go a little bit more. So, yeah. Diwali, yes, finished yes. Diwali finished yesterday, right? Yes, yes that's right. <laughs> and the uh, third speaker of the day <clears throat> is uh, Pierre Ducré from CIS. Uh, from CIS, sorry, from the International Olympic Committee. Pierre is from the third edition, the only student of the FIFA Master who has the same first name as I do. Pierre, how are you? That's a big title to have. We share a first name, so I'm fine. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you for, for having me. No, thanks to, to thanks for your participation. So the objective of today' uh, webinar is to to have a, a reflection regarding mega events and how mega events uh, are. I don't know, are dealing with these pandemics. And clearly you all three were involved in uh, organizing and thinking mega events uh, for 2020. And uh, uh, some of the some of the events had to be had to be um, postponed. Uh, one of the objective of our today's meeting is to to really see what can be learned out of the situation. So I would I would start uh, with Ashley, so you had to re rethink a world championship in ice hockey. So, what mm -hmm. did you learn from that? Um, yeah, so we actually had to we cancelled half of our season last year due to um, COVID, and um, I definitely a lot of learning experiences. Um, and um, we learned to work very closely with the governments, which is something we've never done before, particularly with ensuring the least effect for our organizers with respect to the cancellation of those events. We also, you know, thinking about um, contracts or, you know, previous work we did for the, ch um, for the championships, we never thought, for example, about the divisibility of our contracts so we could allocate proper um, sponsorship money to each of those individual championships. So um, we learned uh, a lot of things we did wrong previously that allowed us to correct it, particularly which is which is important for this current season because we are dealing with the exact same thing we dealt with last season. Now, great. So we will we will talk later a bit about it uh, other time. So uh, yeah, uh, we know that uh, the the. Uh, Olympics had had been had to be postponed. What did you learn about this very hectic year for you, I mean? Well, I actually learned that they can be postponed because uh, uh, I think as long as I've been at the IOC, I've always been told anything can change but the date of the opening ceremony. So I guess the big learning is that even that is something that can change. And I think from event organizer standpoint, if you look at this, it's really uh, a lessons learned that uh, in terms of planning and preparing for all um, options that could happen, you really need to consider as well that things like pandemic can come up and that to go back to what Ashley was mentioning, 
there is a possibility that uh, your contract needs to cover. You need to understand that this is something that can happen. You need also to have discussions with your partners that uh, involve this being a possibility. So I think where before a number of things were set in stone in terms of operational parameter, legal parameter, budget, with what happened to the games, to many other events, I think uh, the, the takeaway will be that you need to think about the event itself, but also what can happen if uh, another such pandemic was to take place. So flexibility, I think, will be the main takeaway when it comes to uh, event planning. Absolutely. And Roma, uh, in the case of the of the youth championship in in uh, in in, uh, in in India, what did you learn in this in these moments? Uh, it was not easy. No, it hasn't been easy. We postponed the tournament. We took an early decision way back in May to postpone it to 2021. But as you see, also things stand. Uh, it, the pandemic, the next wave of pandemic is right now. Currently, we are seeing it play out. But I think one of the major takeaways that has been a learning, uh, at least for us, is flexibility, like PM mentioned, and also a realization of the impact that sport plays in society. For instance, if you look at it during the 2008 economic crisis, at least people had sports and entertainment to look forward to, to take away from the grim reality. However, with the case where all forms of entertainment, including sport, had to modify, it's been a huge change in society. And that's something we see even as we're dealing with, uh, what do you say, youth championships and also the impact that you see at a younger age and younger age groups. For us, that's also been a very important learning. So, what, do you know, as an historian, I'm fascinated by the kind of discussion you may have between sports team, sports institution and policy makers. Uh, from one moment, uh, you are we are all in the same in in the same boat, and and the discussion must have uh, uh, have probably said a lot about the place of sport for society as well. Did you did you see from this point of view an, uh, a, a clear joint thinking about it? That's a, that's a very interesting element. Uh, absolutely, yes. From our perspective, also, if you look at it, uh, we are here talking about a U-17 Women's World Cup in India, as well as talking about women's sports. So the development part uh, plays a very crucial uh, element in terms of us hosting the tournament in India. It was a similar exercise that we took place in 2017. So we did look at it from all perspectives, understanding that this has to reach uh, ultimately to a much wider audience. We're here talking about 1.32 billion. So at least half of those who did see the men's under 17 in 2017, we had to reach them. The development programs came to a halt. So all policymakers, including FIFA, within the Federation, as well as the host cities and the central government have been in, uh, what do you say, in complete sync that these are unusual circumstances and we have to keep that in mind. Yes, definitely. I would say from the from the IHF's perspective, I think that from a policy perspective, both IHF and also the government, you realize that there was such a lack of policy to deal with the situation. And we had a lot of issues, like for example, our worlds last year was supposed to be in Switzerland between two different cantons. Two different cantons had different um policies, different procedures for making a decision. Do we cancel? Do we not cancel? The IHF, we had no real procedures and policy to deal with the situation. And we were having um, a bit of a struggle getting answers from the right people. And that was without a doubt with um, a lack of having policies. So I think that one key learning experience we have is that now we're able to develop these policies and approach governments where our events are organized earlier to ensure that we have all of these scenarios that could potentially occur lined out in advance of actually having the event. And the oh, role of the lawyer, the, and the role of the lawyer in the federation. So you are head of the legal department became very important, probably. Yes, very quickly. <laughs> My, um, I had a lot of phone calls very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so Pierre, you must. How, how much hours did you sleep during the spring period? 
I hope it doesn't show, but not a lot. But still today, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a lot because obviously when you deliver the games and uh, we know about you know the complexity of the, uh, uh, of the event, uh, there's a lot of pieces. And now the problem is that all of these pieces, they continue to change shape. So as if you're trying to do a puzzle with pieces that don't have uh, the same shape from one day to the next. So when you have a lawyer at the end of the chain, as Ashley was mentioning, it's very complicated because one day you plan for something and the next day you need to adapt. Mm -hmm. And I think the key takeaway in this respect when it comes to relationship with the government is really that, first of all, you need to build and to have extremely strong relationship with the government. Uh, those relationships will be tested when you deliver an event, but when you have to postpone an event, you reach an entire new level of collaboration. And if you've been able to solidify good relationships, I think it really can show uh, when you go through um, a series of changes like we are doing now. So I would say this is really important uh, aspect that uh, early in the project, you need to be close to the policymakers, understand, as per the example of the two cantons in Switzerland, that there are differences, that their interests, uh, their objectives will be different, but trying to make sure that everybody feel they are around the table and understand what we are trying to do. So at the very early stage of the process, we spent a lot of time making sure we understood the objective of the government, we understood the objective of the organizers, of the city of Tokyo, of the Olympic movement and all of its key stakeholders to make sure that, as per you, what you said earlier, Pierre, how do you build a policy around postponing the games that can satisfy the most, uh, let's say, central objective of each stakeholder? Yes, because uh, what I what I wanted to, to, to ask you is as well, you have to put yourself as well in the pants of the sports person, the athletes. They train months and months to reach this key moment. And it must be incredibly difficult for the athletes. Did you speak with them uh, at the moment you took the decision or they are just to accept it? No, for us, it's very clear. You know, we are doing this for the athletes, uh, first and foremost. So we have to secure at the very start the understanding that, uh, you know, this is the basic element of the plan. So we said, okay, we can change a lot of things, but we can't touch the services to the athletes and how they will experience the games. We very quickly also confirmed that all of the athletes that had qualified already for 2020 will see their qualification spot carried forward to 2021. We also confirmed all of the scholarships that the IOC is paying to those athletes to be uh, taken forward by one year. And we have, as you may know, an athletes commission, which is composed of people that are athletes that get elected during the games. And they've been a part of the conversation all the way through because we wanted to make sure they understood what we were trying to do, how we were trying to do it, but also that they could feed the, uh, the impressions and the opinions of the athletes community into our, uh, our project. And we continue to do that on all fronts. You know, we had to re-secure the Olympic Village with a number of caveats. Okay, let's talk with the athletes. What does it mean? What are the kind of concessions we want to do, knowing that we will have to deliver the event still with some levels of uh, COVID around? And know at this point in time exactly what? But we need to plan for all different options and we are talking to them to make sure we are all on the same page. But uh, I would say in general, one of the key takeaways as well of this period is despite the physical distance, I think we've never worked closer with all of our stakeholders on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to make sure that we are completely aligned on uh, replanning the games. Yes, and in the case of India, you are dealing with people who are minor of age and it must be must, must, must have been more difficult as well from this point of view, wasn't it? Absolutely. We are dealing here with minors. So coming into India requires parental consent. But also if you see the qualifications were a, a major problem as well. We only had qualifications from Asia. So effectively, we knew four teams before the pandemic started and most of the qualifications were supposed to have taken place uh, this year itself. So these were some of the unknown elements that we were dealing with uh, and we are still dealing with at this point of time. So, to so know if, are, the, if, the, if the 
at least eligible in 2020 will be eligible in 2021. So that is the case. So FIFA, like we have mentioned, even uh, like the IOC made that uh, conditional that the age group remains the same irrespective of the tournament being hosted in 2021. However, the teams were yet to be qualified as well, barring from the Asian uh, Confederation. No, that, that's, that's a very, I mean, I think it's very interesting because it shows as well that, that sporting institutions are of sensibility are sensitive to mm -hmm. the the needs and the preparation of the athletes it's it's mm -hmm. absolutely essential how did it work with the with the qualification for the next for the 2021 world cup in in, in ice hockey from this point of view um well the ihf our structure is a bit different so we run a championship every year and we have a promotion relegation system down through all of our championships and we actually um, made the decision, even though some were played, some weren't, that no teams will promote and relegate. And we actually made that decision for this year as well, because we are canceling or making the decision to move forward with the championship three months in advance. So if we cannot play the full division, then there will not be promotion or relegation between the two divisions. Um, so we made that our sporting committee made that decision that we'll still play for the, the benefit of the sport, because it's um, not playing two, two years in a row, two championships is really detrimental to ice hockey in certain of our countries. So we made the decision we will play. It'll be called a world championship, which will be good for that country and their, um, their government for funding, but there will be no promotion relegation because the championship ahead of it or below it in the division were not played. Um, I think the IHF is in a unique situation because we are obviously very much focused on the players. We're really focused on them from a health and safety perspective, but also we have to deal with the clubs because we have a world championship in a situation where a lot of our clubs have to have had to postpone seasons. Seasons usually start in September. We have some starting in December. We have some starting in January. And because they have contracts, they have sponsors, et cetera, they're looking to um, run their season longer so that they can ensure they get all the broadcasting revenue to ensure they can get all their sponsorship revenue, which then affects the release of the players for the national team. So this is hugely something we're dealing with moving forward to 2021 is to negotiate with the clubs and the leagues to find the appropriate dates of our world championships, which we've already postponed for two weeks now. Um, hopefully we'll be able to play the event. Um, but we are also, in addition to, you know, worrying about the players and dealing with the players and trying to play because it is such a catapult for their career, also trying to work with the clubs to ensure that the clubs maintain and the leagues maintain their viability, which is really important right now. Yeah, and, and the three other actors are clearly the sponsors, the partners and the public. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you told us a little bit how you, how, how you worked with the, with, the, with the sponsors, but with the mm -hmm. other partners, with the major partners and mm -hmm. with the public, did you, where, where did you put the, the, the art of your campaign? Pierre, at the, uh, at the IOC, what was the policy of the IOC to, to, to keep the, you know, the, the partners, the, the sponsors and the public informed? It was not easy in a complicated situation. Mm -hmm. I think for any event, it is uh, very complicated considering the circumstances. When you have uh, an event like the Games that has so many stakeholders involved, the only policy you can apply is transparency. For us, it was very clear from day one, we would run a lot of consultations at political level, at technical level with all the stakeholders to make sure that we could collect uh, their feedback, as I mentioned earlier, but making sure that we are uh, addressing the, 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 key, the key concerns. Because in those moments, you want to make sure that you can work with all of them uh, in a very uh, close uh, manner. You need to understand what broadcasters need. You need to understand what um, media, press, agencies will have as challenges to uh, manage a one-year postponement because for all of them, the objectives is different, the organizational setup is different, and the way they are approaching uh, their preparation is different. And you need to make sure that when you give uh, updates to all these stakeholders, it actually uh, suits them. They have the information they need. And you were talking about spectators, Pierre, clearly here, you need to understand what's the experience for a spectator. It's having a ticket, entering a venue, having accommodation, traveling there, so all these elements you need to understand, okay, by postponing the game for, by one year, 
how did we, uh, you know, uh, impact this uh, this experience? And we've been thinking all the way through about what is the best way to mitigate the impact, trying to make sure that uh, the plans which existed for 2020 can still exist for 2021. And sometimes it's possible. Sometimes it's possible, it would, but it would be way too costly. So you have to change the course of action. And sometimes we just dropped elements of the project. And I think we try to look at uh, the, the postponement of the games as an opportunity as well to push ourselves even further than we already were in terms of simplifying the games, trying to make sure that in the retaking place of the event, we really focus on the essentials. And you mentioned it before, the essential part is athletes and their ability to compete in a fair environment at the top of their performance. And that's been our, our driver, but obviously trying to make sure as well that all the stakeholders do get the means to do what they have to do on site, be it an hospitality program or uh, filming or um, just signing contracts or anything. You need to make sure that uh, everybody is empowered to do what they have to do, maybe in a slightly optimized environment, but still able to do it. Yeah, uh, the concept of force majeure has been the key word for many people. Uh, so, what we what we had the impression is a lot of the a lot of the evolution during the last spring was about really. Uh, understanding how people work together, and and uh, I think one one of the reason why I was very pleased to have this this webinar today is there are new forms of collaboration that grew up during this year, and that probably will help understanding better how it works in the various elements. We invited in the FIFA Master last week uh, one of the specialists of the European City of Europe, and he explained us. Uh, I think he was at every single edition you had in, in your class each year, Franco Bianchini. And uh, uh, he, he, he said uh, in, his, in, his, in his lecture, do you know for mega events in culture, they are facing new problems now and they are imagining to, to promote themselves differently and they need to collaborate probably with mega events in sports, with mega events in other or other forms, religion, sports, culture, needs to work together to see how these new forms of working to large events is possible in a post-COVID situa situation. Did you have in the recent months a uh, discussion with people from other uh, organizations who are not necessarily sports organizations as well? You're asking me? Any of the three? Who wants to speak? No, ladies speak? first, of course. Ladies first. Any, any, any links with, with other organizations who organize big events? Uh, so, Pierre, start, I think. We uh, sort of seen... Yes, yes, Roma, please. Uh, we sort of, uh, we've, we've sort of had this kind of discussion. As you know, cricket is one of the biggest sport in India. We've seen them... Uh, you know, battle deal with a similar situation. They were supposed to host a T20 World Cup in Australia and then a Women's World Cup early uh, in 2021. So they too certainly have been impacted. And we've had these kind of similar discussion in terms of how this impacts and what are the challenges okay. that we, we have. We have a question from Stella Iris on uh, on YouTube. Have you reached or can you say something about the cost of postponing postponing a mega mega event compared to canceling it? Uh, what are the factors you have looked at and took into consideration for your decisions? Maybe we start with the lawyer. <laughs> um <clears throat> So um, with respect to the cost for the IHF, we started a long time ago a risk assessment, which allowed us to fortunately have very good insurance coverage and allowed us to mitigate most of the costs, costs for our um, event we had to cancel last year. But it also has allowed us to um, be smarter because 
For example, for the next one, we are not sure if we will have insurance coverage. So I think that it, it makes you a maybe set aside more funds in case you have to cancel an event, but also not to spend money in unnecessary places and to really um, slim your budget to ensure that you're only spending um, money that is necessary when you are organizing an event. And I think that that also goes that information is a transfer between you and your partners to ensure that you're both on the same page with with respect to um, the money you're going to spend in certain um, areas. So I would say that's our biggest takeaway from having to cancel an event. Risk, 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 controlling your risk and then making appropriate decisions within your budget and how you spend your money going forward. Yeah, yeah, I, think I couldn't agree more uh, with what uh, uh, Ashley uh, just explained. With with the COVID, I think an organization uh, like we have, which was already very uh, crisis management oriented, because uh, this is an event we're having every two years, so it's not like we can afford not to do it. It's not like when you have recurring uh, matches or events. It's it's of a different nature. So for us, we are already very deep into being able to handle all situations and. Uh, we do have insurance. We do have uh, contracts that uh, you know take into account a large number of uh, of elements. But I think through this crisis, we will have to go to the next level of understanding and what is the best combination of uh, you know doing the event or not doing it, considering the contracts you have. Because it's one thing about the organization, like uh, the uh, organizing committee in India or the IHF or the IOC. But you also need to understand what it means for all your constituents. Because if you cancel the event, then everybody also is not getting the, uh, you know, the money or the expected output. So you have to look at the cancellation or the decision to take uh, part into the event as really a team effort and a team decision, because it really has to factor in so many different variables and I think the, the main takeaway as well of the of the COVID is that you can't make that decision alone somehow. You really need to make sure Absolutely. that going left or right is the best option for everyone. Yeah, and please, Roman. Exactly. Exactly. Taking it, you know, taking it exactly from what Pierre Ashley said for us, like from an organizing committee perspective, we also have to weigh in options in terms of the infrastructure development the investment that has been made by the various host cities by the governments and also in terms of a lot of development programs that have been put in place especially as in terms of legacy in the lead up to the tournament so all of those things also come to an to a halt so especially in case of youth tournaments we have to factor in terms of the actual impact in terms of the sporting legacy that these youth tournaments at least i'm talking more from an organizing committee perspective from an loc perspective federation that how this impacts and then it sets it back in terms of especially when we talk about uh, new uh, tournaments that come into developing countries so yes. exactly it's the continuity, even in these kind of situations, at least from where we see, it's extremely important. Yeah, the 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 element connected to the to the concept of uh, of legacy is absolutely essential, isn't it? Everywhere, absolutely, yeah. Ab absolutely, because uh, sometimes what these mega events they do, I know there is a lot of cynicism and a lot of uh, what do you say towards the words legacy. But if you look at it carefully, I'm, I'm here not talking about the bigger events. I'm here talking in terms of the youth championships or in a lot of other sports. It does leave an impact. It does, uh, if you think about it thoughtfully and if you do put in programs which reach the communities, they do. We've certainly seen that impact with hosting one FIFA tournament, youth tournament in 2017 and another one which was due to be held in 2020 how it can act as a catalyst and leave a legacy, for sure. Uh, regarding legacy of this kind of mega youth events, we have a course uh, with CIS and FIFA in, uh, in various countries, uh, Costa Rica, uh, uh, Chile, uh, who had the World Cup of, of women 17, and we saw how important it was for the long-term development of the women's game. It is definitely a, a key event and from that point of view a mega event uh, let's 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 go back to the case of uh, 
of the the first one who had to uh, to announce it it was uh, the situation of ice hockey it was difficult you had to deal really at the start of the of the of the strong moments so now is the time what would you what would you think were the key elements you had to do was essential what, what was the essential behavior that for for the next future you learned from it's i think the case of of ice hockey is very interesting from this point yeah. of view because it's a winter sport yeah no um i think we've kind of almost covered it like for us it's communication like we uh, you know formed our group of key people that were going to be part of these decisions that were going to be and what their strategic role with it within this this decision making process was who is responsible for ensuring what and ensuring that we all talked and we were all constantly in communication that there was no one out of the loop this is with our media this is with you know me dealing with legal and insurance this is with our president really dealing with the politics with the loc and the swiss government so if anything i've learned is that you know what what allowed us to survive is we had our roles and we had excellent communication in um, ensuring that those roles were being met and that we were making right decisions at the right time yeah i i imagine that for the for the ioc the situation was a little bit more complex during the, during last last spring and and you had a government uh, that you had to deal with a government from it's it's a highly important decision the uh, uh, for for it was an, a very important decision for the japanese government at that time and was that was there at some moment some some discussion about are the Olympics or the mega events becoming too big sometime? Well, I think this conversation about, you know, uh, the management of the cost and complexity of the games, that, that wasn't something which was born out of COVID, right? I think uh, our president launched uh, an agenda for 2020. We've done considerable work on streamlining the cost and complexity of the games. And the Tokyo Games actually are a very bad, good backdrop for us because we applied a lot of the new options we give to uh, host cities and the savings that they achieved of the nature of $4.3 billion indicate that definitely the steps we have taken have, uh, have allowed us to make the games more flexible. I would say with those changes, we probably had an actual possible task to postpone the games in the way we did. So uh, I fully agree uh, that, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, you need to really reach the maximum level of flexibility you can have when you're an event organizer and you have to postpone uh, something like the games. I mean, it's never been done before. So you have to develop a new blueprint. But the ability that we have developed over the last 10 years, I would say, to really uh, make the event more flexible, to work in an even closer partnership with uh, uh, the organizing committee, has really made a difference. And I, and I would say, Pierre, to go back to a question you asked before, uh, for us, it has been key as well to work with uh, the federations, winter, summer, to understand their experience, how they responded to the crisis, how they managed their event. Now we have a lot of sport returning to action. How are they returning to action? What measures they are uh, applying? Because for us, those sports returning to action, it's a positive sign that it's possible to have Olympic Games next summer. There's a lot of learnings as to what should be done to feel, to have the athletes, to have the participants feel secure. So we are working very, very closely with the sport movement. We have two to three debriefs every week with international federation or event organizers to collect that, uh, that input. And to the other question you asked earlier, I think I should have started at the very beginning with, I think the key takeaway from this whole thing is really the place of sport in society. Absolutely. Because very clearly, uh, I've never seen so much demand for sport being as a you know watcher on TV, but as a person in the street wanting to do sport. And I think it's more relevant than ever that we are trying to deliver events, to continue to inspire people, I was hearing news on the radio this morning that in France, they see a drop 20% in youth going into sport uh, since the start of COVID. And that's exactly what we don't want. So we need to fight on our respective fronts so that we can continue to you know, generate funds for sport, inspired kids to go into sport. And th that probably is something that sometimes we tend to not have at the forefront of our thinking. 
but I think uh, COVID really brought it uh, full speed back in front of our of our eyes. Yes, and it's 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 a period in which we we can imagine as well the the increase of esports. It has been discussed the the organization of mega events. Uh, is there more idea to to have e events next to the mega events themselves in the future? From what you have learned in this, with all the meetings and the e, the zooms and yeah. the e meetings ever, uh, taking place all the time, are you thinking as well to increase yeah. the e events connected to your sport? Some federation have done it. We saw it with cycling. Yeah, I can, please. Actually. Yep, I can start with that because we actually did that really quickly. So when we made the decision last year to cancel our world, our primary concern after, you know, worrying about the athletes um, was how do we stay engaged with our fans? Like we did not want to go an entire year without having a world championships. So very quickly overnight, we put together an e-fan world championship. We were able to use in partnership with NHL, the NHL game. And literally it happened I think the fastest project for a federation particularly to put together and actually the the amount of fans that participated in this eSport World Championship, I mean, it was incredible. And for sure it kept, it, it kept the event alive for our fans, which I think is really important for IHF particularly because this is a yearly event. So for us to not have it for a year, that's very significant. And um, so we um, put it together, I think in like two weeks and it went, it was amazing. And so it also has allowed us to make the decision to start running these in conjunction with some of our major events because the, the fan engagement was absolutely incredible. Great. No, no, it's, we, we saw it largely uh, discussed in, in, various, in various cases. Is it the case with IOC? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, this uh, crisis has... I think pushed every organization, including the IOC, to accelerate digital transformation, to build up capacities to engage with fans even more in a remote manner because there wasn't much else to do, as Ashley pointed out. So I think this is a reality for the entire sporting movement. I think we've learned of the value of having, uh, you know, sports that can transfer easily into the digital um, sphere. Uh, I think never before have we seen developments of uh, apps and other means to connect people while they are still at home doing sport. And in the context of the Olympic game, this obviously is something we are following very closely because you can suddenly expand the community, uh, let's say, that is in contact with your event, whether it's before the event, but also during the event. We were doing development in Paris to have mass event, for example, of having maybe a number of people running on the same course as the marathon later in the day, but through the development of, let's say, e-version of the sport, not e-sport, because I think e-sport is, uh, is a different entity, but uh, doing, uh, you know, cycling in your living room whilst, uh, you know, the athletes are doing that on the course. Uh, this is really taking a leap forward through this crisis and it's definitely something that uh, sport entities, sport federation organizers will have to recognize as a force that I think is not going to go anywhere in the future. And that has to be a key factor in building communities and um, in engaging your fans throughout the year. For us, it's always a major challenge because as I said earlier, we have an event every two years. And in the meantime, you need to be able to uh, continue this engagement. And that's something that I believe will only grow stronger for for all of us. Great. Now it's uh, it's it's so interesting for us as well. I just put you in our situation, and I would ask you a question as uh, one of the one of the teachers and the and the organizers of the FIFA Master. Do you know we are building the international sports managers we have to to deal with the future unfortunately we didn't prepare you to the to the covid we spoke about crisis management uh, but not uh, exactly to the to the uh, uh, to to such a situation what do you think uh, from your experience we need to be, be to better prepare your future colleagues where do they need to really improve their knowledge 
to, to be able to deal with such a situation. Flexibility. Okay, we can try to prepare them to flexibilities. But to be a bit more precise, what would you what would you encourage us to to bring the students to to, to know more? Um, I'll comment from a legal perspective. Sure. Um, so I have written contracts my entire life, and I always wrote this force majeure clause into every single contract, and it was very theoretical for me. The practicality of it was always um, a bit in the clouds. So I would always, I would now advise lawyers who work in anything with respect to um, sporting events for sports to understand the practicality of it, understand their language and how that will actually apply to the individual situations that will cause force majeure because it is um, it's super important because as lawyers, we, you know, we write the language, but we need to make sure that practicality, those people who will implement that will actually be able to um, follow the language we write. Great. From a, from a, a media perspective, you come both uh, Pierre and, Ro and Roma from uh, uh, one part of your, your background is, is connected to, to communication. Roma, what would you say should be learned from the future, for the future, from the communication point of view? I think uh, from a communication perspective, uh, yes, crisis communication is important, but it's also about, uh, you know, like Kashi Pierre and I have you've mentioned, discussed in the past, being honest and transparent with your stakeholders, which also include media and consistency in communications, uh, which certainly play a huge part. And bringing then, again, if you're talking here about communication from a media communication perspective, it would also be keeping in mind that they are valuable stakeholders. And at the same time, in situations like these, there is a dearth of stories, which would normally have been taken uh, in a regular cycle with the news updates with other various sports. It would have been taken. But uh, at this point of time, keeping that communication clear is very important. I'd say keep an overall consistency in communication, making sure your stakeholders have that information ahead of the media communication that takes place. Those facts. Yeah, any sure. point you would like us to prepare more our your future colleagues in the future based on what you learned this year? I think if you enter the sport industry today, you need to understand, and you named it, Pierre, but you need to understand that uh, the reality that is today may not be the reality of tomorrow. So that flexibility of approach, that ability of people to just be versatile and change their course of action overnight is something that will be, I think, immensely valued by organizers in the future because it's just the reality of the world we live in. We are living in an exponentially growing uh, environment when it comes to digital. We are living in an environment that has possibility to see a pandemic come through and change everything in a few weeks. So I, I think it's really important that uh, this is recognized as a central uh, skill for anyone to have. I would say for them also, uh, in terms of uh, approach, um, crisis management probably will not carry the same meaning in the future because the reality is you're more looking into not triggering crisis management mechanisms, but having also already the alternatives identified before so that you can just open the drawer for many options and just pick the one that makes the most sense according to the circumstances you are, you are in. And the last thing I would say is never undervalue the strengths of partnership. There is definitely uh, a fundamental value in uh, being able to take the group of people you are working with through a very tense situation and to rely on the strengths of those partnerships so that everybody is pulling in the same direction. Because I'm pretty sure if you have to postpone an event in a situation where the stakeholders are not very well aligned, the job becomes completely undoable. Whereas if there is a collective willingness to work together and a solid bond existing, uh, I think you, you can make more or less anything happen. Pierre, I would just take forward from what Pierre mentioned. It's something since I come from a cricket loving country, I'd probably use a cricket analogy, which may not make reference to a lot of you, but viewers from India and subcontinent certainly would. I'd probably, my biggest learning has been life or situations like these are not a T20, like it's not about a T20 game, which gets over in three hours. It is more like a test match 
where one inning you may be down but you have an opportunity within the five days to make a comeback so pick yourself up even if there are setbacks learn from those setbacks and move on it's that kind of a mindset is something which will take it forward uh is something which i have learned and which is something we often discuss it within our team as well to keep going because it is not an easy time for anyone <laughs> But Ashley and Pia know very well the, the, the difference between T20 and Test cricket because they learned it as a FIFA master when they were in uh, Leicester. <laughs> I did, actually. And I would say, to use the, uh, the analogy, I see the whole thing as a, a test match, but broken down into T20. Because on our side, the, the, the key element has been that it's very difficult to see the destination when you have to say we're going to do the games or the world championship or the world cup in a year from now people go like well, it's impossible so what you need to do is uh, along your test match have you know milestones which seem much closer for everybody to see and say okay first we're going to decide to postpone the games then we are going to choose a date then we're going to do this and do that and then you can take everybody along i think those those moments where you have to uh, conduct such a big task it's really important you can break it down into something which seems more tangible to everyone. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the, to, to finish, because we, you, we, will have, we will have to finish soon. I was first, I would like first to apologize with the people who ask questions, but I have a technical problem. I cannot see the question. So we, it's, uh, it's more of a discussion between ourselves. Uh, from, the, from the element you took and you spoke, all of you, uh, the idea of partnership and flexibility are the one who, who have, we went to a further, I would say, to, to a further dimension. Uh, now the concept of choosing a partner uh, to organize an event, it means that it is a, a serious decision for all parties. Uh, and and my, my, my vision of the of the crisis is it has as well proved uh, the importance of the events. Uh, the sport is based on events and of the, the discussion about the, 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 the necessity of these mega events. Uh, clearly there will be a, a difference, but it has shown how important live major sport events where things happen are important. Uh, and I think the place of sports for the rest of the world is essential to, to show the going back to normality in this. Did you feel that in all the discussion with you had with the politics, with, with, with politics and local politics about how important your event was to go back to normality, to go back to a, to a world where, where, where people can have understandings that is more clear than uh, what we, are, we were experiencing during this month? Did you see that? I can start maybe. Uh, I think the way it's been positioned uh, on our side is the games are a little bit the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, it's really trying to give to the event that sense of, yes, we can bring back 200 countries in one place in a safe manner and, uh, you know, uh, enjoy the performances of the athletes without having to, uh, you know, deal with all of the... I'm not sure what word I should choose, but uh, difficulties that we had to deal with over the last uh, few months. So I think definitely sport can play that role. And, and Pierre, to your earlier comment, I think all of us have a very good understanding that there is no sport without local organizers and partners. And uh, we are all in the business of finding the best possible hosts and creating partnerships with them. So it's really critical that we continue to have interested parties to organize World Championship, World Cups, uh, games, and so on. Because without those cities, countries, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So throughout this crisis, it's also very key to be able to reassure them that no matter what the circumstances, even can happen, can be successful, and continue to do what they do to a city, to a region, to a country, as we said before the impact of our events can only truly be assessed by the uh, legacy we leave. And, and that's a, a key focus of this whole time. 
Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, Ashley, any, any thought on that? Yeah, so I can give it just a, a real tangible perspective. We have our juniors coming up in Canada and hockey in Canada is like breath to Canadians. The idea of having to cancel this championship during COVID would have had such detrimental effect, not only on the sport, but on their marketing partners, but also on the Canadian morality. Like they are, you know, they're going through the same thing that all um, countries are going through, you know, really struggling with COVID, trying to get over this hump. And the idea of not having hockey at Christmas to be able to watch would have been, I think, really detrimental from a mental perspective of a lot of Canadians and a lot of um, our people who watch, our fans who watch this championship. So I don't think, you know, we've ever worked so hard to make sure an event occurred. And that was, you know, not as much from, you know, the money the IHF gets. It's more of for the fans. It's for the people. It's for the hockey. And I think that really goes to the society element of our sport. Yeah. Uh, well, I would I would uh, uh, thank you, all three of you, so much for your, for your time in this difficult moment where... We are full of meetings, we are full of Zooms, and to have this extra one where we had to, to talk about difficult questions, it's, it's, it, it has been really a, a, a huge pleasure to have you on board. Uh, and I would give you, give you one word of conclusion, each of you, if, if there is something you would like our viewers to remember from, from, from the experience you get, what would you take? Each of you from, in one minute. Who wants to start? Roma, please. Okay. Uh, the experience or the journey, like uh, Pierre and Ashley have also we've discussed, is flexibility. But uh, my takeaway from a local organizing committee perspective, I would say, has been one modification of plans, but understanding our consumers and also understanding that within the country of 1.32 billion, there is a hunger, there is a desire to go back. I mean, way back in August, in the midst of a pandemic, we did a market research to find out what is it that would make Indians come back to stadiums when we announced the postponement to 2021. And we were surprised by the answers, to be honest. 86% of the people that we uh, basically did a poll said they wanted to come back to stadiums. They were comfortable with paying a higher price for their ticket, but come back to the stadium, provided basic measures were put in place. And the measures were very simple. Masks inside the stadiums, maintaining social distancing, which means reduced capacities. But they wanted that sense of normalcy that sports brings in. And again, I'm going to go back to where I started off with. In 2008, during economic crisis, people had, what do you say, sports to sit and watch. This time around, the world has not seen that. And this is something which brings joy. And like everyone else who loves sport, I'm looking forward to having that sense of novelty back. That's been for me, to be honest. Thanks so much. Uh, Ashley. Yeah, my, my thoughts are pretty similar. Like, I think that all of us who work in sport, we should never undervalue what we do because I think it's, you know, in this crisis, we really contribute to getting society back to normal. And we really contribute to, contribute to um, almost like removing people from the situations that they're dealing with through the sport that we're able to provide during the COVID crisis. So I think that, you know, some people will push sport off or the governments will say, oh, we have bigger things to worry about. There's more important things. But I think that, you know, we need to push our governments and we need to understand that we really do bring value to making the situation better and helping people during the situation. Great. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I fully agree with that. I think uh, the social value of sport has been highlighted more than ever through this period. So I, I will fully uh, concur with Ashley and Roma. I would say something else more from a management standpoint, uh, something that we, we said uh, within the IOC early on is, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. And somehow uh, that's what we try to do. This is as big a crisis as we could ever imagine. But we try to look at it in a way, okay, well, we have to deal with this, but what can we do out of this crisis that can make us better in the future? And we spent a lot of time looking at how we can make the games even more flexible, make our event, uh, you know, more able to go through a period like this. And we already now are taking forward to the next organizers some of the takeaways of these games, trying to make sure that the, the uh, modifications we did 
can be applied to our baseline and making sure the games are better able in the future to uh, deal with this kind of situation and uh, to be more flexible for the organizers. So uh, I would say no matter how complicated it can get, there is always something to learn. And it's really up to the organization to decide if uh, they want along as they are, uh, um, along with the resolution of the problem, trying to find opportunities to, you know, prepare the future at the same time, which is what we try to do. Well, I would, I would like to, uh, to, to thank you all three so much. Uh, I know that uh, it's, it's not an easy time. I know it's, it's very complicated to, to, organize, uh, to organize and plan the future in, dif in, in such difficult situation. And uh, I wish you all the possible success for all the, the events you will organize in the next future. And I thank you for your, your, your disponibility. Uh, well, for the rest of the, of the persons, we will meet in, uh, in, in two weeks again. And I wish everybody a, a, good, uh, a good time. And don't forget to connect to our, to, our, uh, to, to our page to know a little bit what we are, what we are doing. Thank you so much and uh, have, a nice, have a nice rest.